Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner. This is the first new episode of 2017. I hope you all had a fantastic Christmas, had a great new year, and I hope we make this a great year for Liberty too. I will be doing uh, my small piece of that, and I know many of my listeners, many of you guys out there will be too. So I thank you. We're all in this together. So yeah, I... um was in England and seeing my family uh, over the Christmas and New Year period. And I took the opportunity to do some reading. You know, when you're creating content, it is so important to be reading, to be feeding the mind, synthesizing all that good stuff that goes in there so that you can put good stuff out into the world. And, uh, you know, the last few months, I really haven't been doing that enough. And I've been very aware of it. So it was good to have a little holiday. Um, I can say holiday rather than vacation because I was in England, right? So I, I'm going to be using a little bit of British English. I, I haven't, I've only been back a couple of days as I'm recording this, so you might hear a few Britishisms still. Um, yeah, so, you know, it was good to uh, get some reading done. And in particular, I have been reading two books that I want to tell you about. Um, I just mentioned the first one right now because I'm going to talk more about the second one throughout this show. But the first book I wrote, I read was uh, by a guy called Gustav Le Bon. And it's called The Crowd. And I think it was written in 1895. So uh, it's, you know, obviously old, but still very readable. It's not too long. And it's one of the first, maybe the first, serious study of um, crowd psychology. Now, obviously, if you are in political activism, it is, that's an important topic, right? That's something it's worth knowing about. So, you know, you can download that as a free PDF, uh, what with it being, you know, well out of copyright. Um, Gustave Le Bon, The Crowd. Uh, he writes in, um, he was writing in French, obviously, with that name, uh, is a Frenchman. And it was, it's really interesting in that book. It's kind of a philosophical book. It's quite an academic book, although, you know, a popular kind of academic book. Um, but, you know, he's writing at that time as a Frenchman, and he is drawing these differences, uh, identifying these differences between French continental Latin crowds, on the one hand, and Anglo crowds, Anglo-Saxon crowds. And he, from that, talks about also the difference between uh, French, for example, and English and American democracies. Um because the character of the democracies relates, obviously, to the different characters, psychologies of the crowds um, that form among these different races. And it's kind of a fascinating little study. So, I, you know, check it out. Gustave Le Bon, The Crowd, um, that was good reading. And uh, the other book that I'm going to talk more about um, that I read was simply called The Authoritarian Dynamic. And that is an academic social science book. Um, I think the author's Karen Stenner. Um, fantastic book. I have been talking a lot about authoritarianism in kind of a hand-waving, very general way on this show. Um, well, for most of the last year, to be honest, right? As we've been watching uh, what's been happening in the GOP and also watching some of the... Uh, you know, crazy shenanigans, especially on campuses, uh, the hard left. So I've been talking about, I actually wrote an article a few months ago, um, maybe more than a few months ago now, uh, the authoritarians have trumped the GOP. So I've been talking about um, uh, Trump with his uh, authoritarian tendencies. Uh, Certainly a lot of his pronouncements are politically authoritarian. He seems to have drawn a lot of support from those uh, with authoritarian dispositions. Um, So it's made sense to talk about that as we've watched his rise. And then on the left, uh, we've had 
this, you know, this phenomenon of this massively rising illiberal left where they want to basically control free speech on campus and hound hound out anyone that isn't uh, basically doing enough of the correct virtue signaling um, basically the authoritarian left, the authoritarian cultural left, as I've discussed, has been um, putting down uh, those who would uh, who who want to see diversity of opinion and diversity of politics uh, on campuses and and throughout society. Right? Obviously, on. A campus, diversity of opinion and thought and politics is hugely important. If there's one place where we need to have it to fulfill the purpose of the place, it's in a university, in an educational environment. So it's uh, been a very dangerous phenomenon, uh, I believe, this rise of cultural authoritarianism throughout education um, in the Amer- America over the last uh, one, one and a half decades. This is something that Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, talks about a lot. I have discussed him on this show. Um, I actually use some of his research. He's a moral psychologist. I use some of his research in my own seminars where I'm teaching political communication. Um, I post a lot of his stuff, too, on the Blue Republican Facebook group. Uh, he talks a lot about this um, overwhelming takeover by the left of uh, of American universities and how even in the last 20 years everything has changed on campuses and now how even professors are themselves scared that they cannot do their job honestly and openly um, because if they transgress some uh, you know hard leftist cultural norm uh, you know they will be hauled up for discipline etc etc so um, we've got all of that going on so we've got authoritarianism of the left we've got authoritarianism of the right we go into this year with politics and culture defined more by overt authoritarian than uh, authoritarianism than perhaps um well, any year since I've been here, and I've been in the States now for, for 12 years. So we live in interesting times. And as libertarians, and obviously, um, I mean, I'm iffy about using the word libertarian because it's so loaded and it alienates so many people. But obviously, broadly, um, if you're listening to this show, you're probably from that family, political family. We are the antithesis of authoritarians. Right. So we really need to understand what is this philosophical enemy. This book I've been reading, The Authoritarian Dynamic, uh, is a deep and wide empirical study of exactly that question. What is the nature of authoritarianism and when does it um, kind of rear its head in a society, in a culture and start driving the politics? You've got to read it. It's great stuff. In fact, you know, maybe I will try and get in touch with the author, um, a professor, and uh, get her on the show. But I'm going to... It stimulated my mind a lot. And so I'm just going to share some of the thoughts that I've had um, stimulated by this book. Uh, that's what I want to do for this show. And uh, that, that seems an appropriate way to start the year, really, doesn't it, given where we are? But before I do that, um, I just want to uh, draw your attention to... The shows that I've recorded recently, uh, since we've gone from being the Blue Republican radio show with Robin Kerner to being Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner, um, the last three or four shows have been really kind of interesting. Um, Earlier in December, I did a show about Project Arizona, which is... um, a kind of very interesting project based in Phoenix, run by a poll, a gentleman from Poland, a friend of mine actually, who I've worked with teaching in Poland in previous years, um, who's bringing people who are, uh, he's bringing people under this Project Arizona to America to learn the philosophy of liberty, um, to learn what it means to be effective in a corporation, to help these uh, young adults with networking, international networking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and he's pulling people from all over, all over the world, like all kinds of countries. Um, so that was one show I did. I then did a show um, with a gentleman called Ford Fisher called Transhuman. Ford Fisher is a filmmaker. He is making a film about this transhumanism movement. Um, Just kind of really out there, really interesting. He knows his stuff. Um, Transhumanism being 
you know, the desire to kind of transcend the limits of one, one's humanity. Um, so kind of incorporate technology into one's body, into one's brain, etc., etc., and all the benefits that uh, that can bring. We discussed that. I did a show on liberty in Africa, speaking to a Students for Liberty organizer from Nigeria. Uh, again, kind of we covered so much ground, right? This show, the last few episodes covered so much ground. So I really feel like I've been stepping it up, which is great. And, and one of my favorite shows recently was actually the last one that I did on exhuming state constitutions. Now, this is really relevant to uh, your rights in your local community, in your city, in your state. State constitutions are really an untapped resource for the taking back of individual rights in America. That was a great show. Check it out. This is Liberty With Love. I am Robin Kerner. We are going into the first break. I will be back in a few minutes. Thanks for being here. So at the end of the last segment, ladies and gentlemen, I was just running through a few of my recent shows. Do check them out. And the place to do that is libertytalk.fm, libertytalk.fm. Just go to the on-demand section, look for Liberty with Love with Robin Kerner, and you can go back into the archives as far as you like. And um, it's all free, of course. So check that out. My show streams at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern on Saturday and Sunday, every Saturday and Sunday. But, uh, you know, within about a day or two, usually the shows go into those archives and you can download them and listen to them or stream them at your leisure. Okay, I said earlier we are going to be talking about authoritarianism. And again, um, the reason I'm kind of so excited to be thinking about it right now is because of the, the learnings I've I've got. I'm still. I'm still getting. I'm still reading this book from Karen Stenner's book, The Authoritarian Dynamic. And I, I should say, I was actually um, put onto this book by Jonathan Haidt, um, who I also mentioned earlier, the moral psychologist. He said it was one of the the, the best um, studies, analyses of authoritarianism. And uh, you know, I haven't read lots of books on authoritarianism, but from this one, just reading this one, I. I'm sure he's right. So, good stuff. Check out the book if you're really into this kind of stuff. Okay, so what is authoritarianism? Well, the first kind of big thing to know, the big kind of click, right, when the penny drops, um, then this is what this book explains. The first thing to know about authoritarianism is that it is an aversion to... Um, lack of oneness and sameness in the community to which one with which one identifies so authoritarians are driven by a desire for oneness with those around them and sameness they want homogeneity now in american discourse lazily the word conservative is often used to refer to folks who are actually authoritarian by that definition, right? Especially people on the left. They look at folks on the right and they think, um, you know, anybody who may be intolerant, they, they think of them as conservatives. They think of them as right wing. Okay. But conservatism and authoritarianism are completely different things. Now, I'm not just making a bunch of assertions here and talk, doing semantics. What's great about this book is um, that it goes into uh, deep and wide empirical studies of the nature of um, conservatism and authoritarianism. And I should also say that conservatism itself not only is confused with authoritarianism, but within it confuses two very different things. Uh, there's status quo conservatism. That refers to a preference for... Um, change that is not too rapid, right? Status quo conservatism, being uncomfortable at disrupting the status quo. But there's also laissez-faire conservatism, which is a desire for um, little government intervention, for small government, for favoring the free market. Libertarians, if they're conservatives at all, are laissez-faire conservatives. Now, in American discourse, they say the word conservative lumps together 
those who are averse to change, those who are averse to difference, i.e. the authoritarians, and those who actually are really comfortable with change if it comes from the private sector rather than being imposed by force, by authority. Okay, so that's the laissez-faire conservatism. So we have a, a difficulty in thinking about authoritarianism in the United States in particular. Um, probably true, actually, uh, in other parts of the world, but it's most confused here in the US. And one of the reasons for that is that the party that um, identifies conservative, that calls itself conservative, right? I'm, I'm generalizing here, but it's a fair generalization. The Republican Party is a coalition of... <laughs> Those who are maybe authoritarian, averse to difference, con- status quo conservatives, averse to change, and laissez-faire, i.e. more libertarian conservatives, right? Now, they're very different psychological, that's important, and political dispositions. And it's kind of a historical accident that they are found in the main in one of only two parties in the United States, right? The Republican Party. So because those, that collection of dispositions, psychologies, and related policies are found in one party that calls itself conservative, we label them all conservative. And in so doing, stop ourselves from actually understanding what the hell authoritarianism is. At times like we find ourselves now in the United States, that's not good enough. Right. We need to know the forces we are dealing with. We need to be able to distinguish them from each other so that maybe we can nurture the ones, the healthy ones, and we can manage or maybe diminish the ones that are going to be destructive to us. Now, one way of thinking about the difference between authoritarianism and conservatism is that, and I mean now status quo conservatism, is that status quo conservatives are averse to too much change, right? In other words, to variation over time, Authoritarians are driven by an aversion to too much variation, if you like, in space among a community at any given time. So one doesn't like change over time. One doesn't like difference across space. All right. Different dimensions. And indeed, it's useful. You know that um, libertarians all know about the uh, the, sm- the smallest political quiz, right, um, where you, they have libertarianism versus authoritarianism on one axis and conservative versus liberal on the other axis. Um, now, this isn't something that was in the book, but it kind of clicked for me as I was reading this book and I saw that um, matrix, that uh, graph in my head, that diagram in my head. And I thought, yeah, one of those axes, the liberal conservative axis, is the preference or otherwise for change axis, right? Or the comfort with change axis. And the orthogonal axis, the libertarian authoritarian axis, is the comfort with difference axis. Think about that. Now, authoritarians and libertarians are not concerned with where we end up, with the end state of society, right? If libertarians, for example, we just want people to be free. Now, maybe these free people will all choose to live in one very homogenous society and all pretty much agree about everything. Or maybe they won't. Maybe there'll be radical variation in preferences and lifestyles in a libertarian society. Libertarians don't really care, right? They don't care about the end state. They're not trying to drive society into one um, particular way of looking. Interestingly, authoritarians in this respect, in this respect alone, are like libertarians. They don't care what their community, what their country chooses to be as much as they care that everybody is choosing broadly the same thing because authoritarians feel threatened by diversity, not by having a society in one state rather than another, right? So authoritarians will support change If it's change that keeps the distribution of um, opinion, of lifestyles, narrow, okay? Authoritarians do that when they feel 
that their society with which they, they identify, community with which they identify, is fragmenting. In other words, when that sameness with that oneness, when that oneness is under threat. Now, as I'm saying that, think about the Donald Trump phenomenon, okay? I said, um, I actually said it on, in an interview on RT, that nobody voted for Trump or for Clinton. They either voted against Trump's personality or they voted against what Clinton represented, right? The Trump thing has been largely a reaction, reaction to a sense of threat. We're going to explore that in this authoritarian framing at the other side of the upcoming break. This is Robin Kerner. In 2011, Robin Kerner wrote the article that launched the biggest coalition for Ron Paul's presidential run called Blue Republican. Now, Stairway Press is pleased to announce the publication of his first book, If You Can Keep It, Why We Nearly Lost It and How We Get It Back. Jeffrey Tucker, who wrote the foreword, says brilliant ideas come in effervescent packages. This is a good description of Robin Kerner's provocative work. It's a work of stunning erudition and sincerity. I also happen to agree with it. I've been struggling toward a similar thesis for a good part of my writing career, though I'm certain Robin has gone beyond even my most mature thought. His section on liberty as a realization of a civilization of love truly sweeps me away with its insight and depth. I know that time is short and that people don't read as carefully as they should, but this section deserves close study by every advocate of liberty it will change the way you think and speak about the topic we need this book now pre-order your personally signed copy of if you can keep it at if you can keep it dot us so carrying on talking about authoritarianism what actually is it i've said that it is um the favoring of oneness, of sameness within the community with which one identifies. And authoritarians, uh, so the studies show, um, basically find a very large part, more than any other um, folks, a large part of their identity in the community of which they are a part and what that community identifies with. So um, when the community fragments... <clears throat> then their identity is under threat. Or to put it another way, when the community's identity is um, unclear, theirs is too, they feel threatened. And this word threat is absolutely critical in understanding authoritarianism. Authoritarianism really is a psychological disposition, right? So there's an authoritarian disposition. It is the... Uh, a disposition that becomes manifest, that turns into action, that motivates action when uh, these things that authoritarians care about, oneness and sameness of their community, are under threat. And that's important because it means you can only see uh, authoritarian um, authoritarianism in politics. Uh, you only see it having cause and effect when there is a threat to the community identity that is perceived by those with that disposition, right? So in a situation of no threat, when society is going along just fine and authoritarians don't feel that their understanding of their community is threatened, and Karen Stenner calls this normative threat, then they behave, they can behave just like conservatives, like liberals, like, even like libertarians, when authoritarians do feel that their identity, i.e. the identity of their community, their country, is threatened, then they will support policies that seek to retrench or protect that identity. Um, so you get the manifestations of intolerance. If you see that um, divergence, there's a, an increasing divergence of view, then you will, if you're an authoritarian, support the suppression of such divergent views. If you see that your community identity is threatened by a particular racial group, let's say, then you will support the uh, policies against that racial group. You will show intolerance. So basically, authoritarianism, the disposition, is manifest as intolerance in politics, in religion, in matters of race and ethnicity, and certainly in uh, morality, when the threat is felt and perceived. 
Now, I've already said that authoritarianism is not the same thing as conservatism, either status quo conservatism, with which it is most often confused, and laissez-faire conservatism, which is actually almost a kind of auth- opposite of authoritarianism, right? Um, authoritarianism seeks sameness. Laissez-faire conser- conservatism wants to let everything and everybody go to be and do whatever they want to be and do. So these authoritarians, which way do they lean politically, right? I mean, do I want, if, I'm, if I want sameness and oneness um, and a narrow distribution of views in my country, do I want those views to be leaning left? Do I want them to be leaning right? Well, of course, you get authoritarians of both stripes, right? You get liberal authoritarians and conservative authoritarians. And um, according to the studies in uh, Stenner's book, uh, I think it's uh, some studies around the world. Uh, she talks about studies that have been conducted in the West and the East, um, all, you know, all over the world. There's, it's basically two to one. There tends to be more conservative leading authoritarians than liberal ones. But if you are driven by the need for sameness and oneness, um, then, you know, in, in the views, in the identity of your country or society, then when it comes to um, how you'll behave at times of threat, your politics are really kind of secondary, right? You're reacting to the threat. Uh, your being liberal or conservative is secondary if you are an authoritarian psychologically, right? But she also says, Stenner also says that in the United States, um, studies show, and I think these studies, they're not the current. I mean, we're going back like maybe 20 years or so. Um, but studies over a, quite a long period suggest that more uh, authoritarians actually identified Democrat back in the 70s and 80s than Republican. Now, obviously, that completely changes, right? That changes. Um, there's no reason uh, for an authoritarian to stay Democrat or to stay re- Republican if Democrat and Republican really refer to a package of political views. Again, authoritarians don't care about the, cer- the particular way society is constructed, whatever. They just want the distribution of ways of being within their society, the society in which they find themselves, to not be threateningly wide, threateningly diverse, and indeed threateningly complex. Um, and certainly authoritarians, uh, if you do the you know, psychological tests and intelligence tests and things like that, um, there are certain predictors of an authoritarian disposition. Low education is a predictor of um, authoritarian disposition. Uh, also, low income is a predictor of an authoritarian disposition. There is also religiosity also. And when you kind of lay them out, in some ways that doesn't really, um, it's maybe not surprising. But interestingly... The predictors work the exact opposite ways for conservatism. Uh, Some of them do, anyway. So, for example, high income is a predictor of conservatism, whereas low income is a predictor of authoritarian disposition. And there I said conservatism. I didn't distinguish between laissez-faire and status quo conservatism because high income is actually a predictor of both status quo and laissez-faire conservatism. Um, Higher education is a predictor of... uh, laissez-faire conservatism, but against authoritarianism, all right? So you can see that clearly conservatism and authoritarianism are very, um, are are completely different things, right? Operating, as I say, on different dimensions. Uh, One concerned with where exactly we're going as a society, the other concerned with um, how wide uh, society is, how diverse society is at any given time, regardless of where it is going. So, you know, I've talked about uh, there being an illiberal left-wing cultural authoritarian, authoritarianism, excuse me, that's risen in the United States. And Jonathan Haidt, as I mentioned before, talks about this a lot. When you understand what authoritarianism is, I think it makes sense right now why it is that we have got what some people would call a right-wing authoritarianism or a more right-wing authoritarianism um, with Donald Trump. Although, of course, I know I and many of my listeners would say economically, he's kind of quite left-wing. Um, but you've got, you know, he's a Republican authoritarian, if we're going to call him an authoritarian for the purposes of this discussion. His star has risen in response to, right, or at least at the same time as the rising of left-wing authoritarianism in the culture, by which I mean, um, you know, 
you can't be for building a wall and monitoring immigration tightly um, because that makes you a racist or it makes you a xenophobe, right? It's this idea that on folks on the left, especially in the campuses, um, they will not only tell you you are bad for having different views from theirs, for having non-progressive views, they will actually deny you your rights, your right to free speech, they will deny. So, for example, Milo Yiannopoulos is trying to get um, to speak at campuses all over the country. And these folks on the left, these social justice warriors, they're rather than just not turning up because they don't like what he has to say, they are trying to prevent him from being able to say it. And that is the crystallization of authoritarianism under threat. Right. It is to actually it becomes OK to deny the rights of the entities, of the people, of the organizations that threaten the oneness, the sameness that you want to see. So the country has seen many, many people in the country have been told by an authoritarian left that they have to change. Yeah, that it's not OK to be what they are. So they have witnessed a fragmentation. Their country is no longer, doesn't feel like one country anymore. They don't feel the same as these, you know, progressives on campus trying to, you know, take away the right of, um, I think the latest one was Condoleezza Rice to even speak, right? Condoleezza Rice, I mean, I don't much care for her politics. I don't like her politics at all. Um, but given her background, of course she's an appropriate speaker at a university. She too recently has been um, kind of hounded out of a speaking engagement at a university, right? Because, you know, she uh, doesn't suit the views of the dominant left on the campus that she was going to speak at, right? So the rest of us see this going on and we are being told by these extreme leftists, the leftist authoritarians, that we are, we're not like them. We're different from them, right? Those authoritarians on the left who want to make everybody and everything like they want it to be have alienated others, including other people with an authoritarian disposition. So for them, they experience this as a fragmentation, we are no longer one, we are two or three or ten different fragments. And not only that, I can't even understand these other folks, you know. And not only do I not understand them, they're telling me I'm evil when I know I'm not, right? So what has happened is left-wing authoritarianism has created the conditions of normative threat for other authoritarians who are responding in kind by protecting themselves politically against the threat, so now one way of understanding what we have in the United States, I think, is a kind of battle of authoritarianisms. There's the left wing flavored authoritarianism and the right wing flavored authoritarianism. But what they have in common as authoritarianisms is more important than what, how they differ. They both want to deny rights to the folks on the other side. And to be fair, I think it's true now that if we look at the campuses... And if we look at, uh, you know, how surprising the Trump victory was, the leftist authoritarians have had the ascendancy. And what you're seeing now is the reaction to the normative threat that the left wing authoritarians represent to the rest of us. Interesting. Hey, very interesting. And I think that tells us also something about how we heal this country, if you think the country needs healing. We talk about uh, division. Um, when you've got authoritarianism against itself, as we have now, you have a very divided country because authoritarians, unique among um, people, you know, the general society, are happy to use force. Not only are they happy to use force, they want to use force to reduce the distribution of um, yeah, political views, moral views, or whatever it might be. OK, so so you're seeing it on the left on the campus and you see, you've heard it with Donald Trump with the, you know, let's shut down the New York Times. Right. That kind of rhetoric. Right. Um, that kind of I don't know if you remember, you know, on the campaign, um, there was this language that he used that kind of was inciting a violence among some of his supporters. It kind of became OK among some of his authoritarian base um, to think like that, to use language like that. Well, really, he's just doing. But from the other side, what He's reacting against, right? <laughs> okay. 
So I think if we know that, if we start to see that, if we understand what authoritarianism is and isn't, we can see what breaking the cycle means, what that would involve. And of course, the opposite of authoritarianism is libertarianism. And a lot of the studies that are cited in this book actually are based on interviews with those who, through various means, are identified as extreme authoritarians and extreme libertarians. And in that case, I'm talking about psychological type. And again, you can't see um, their psychological type in the views they have, the particular views they have, maybe let's say about abortion or gun rights or whatever it might be, until there's a normative threat. And when there's a normative threat, libertarians, people who care about liberty and celebrate diversity, react in the opposite way from authoritarians that are threatened by the freedom of everybody to do what they want. And that's when you see the divergence. We are now at a time of that divergence. Okay, so as libertarians, what do we do about that? How do we replace authoritarianism with libertarianism now, when authoritarianism is riding high, when those psychological dispositions are being manifest in the support of certain uh, policies that seek in one way or another to suppress those who don't conform to our narrow view of what society should be. Well, what we do as libertarians is we reassure we have to be reassuring. And this is actually also tested in studies that are cited in this book. And when I say reassuring, I mean with respect to if you uh, support liberty in this area or that area, our identity as one country, as one society is not threatened. Our commonality of purpose, of identity is not threatened. Now, that's not always a trivial sell, right? Because obviously the whole point of liberty is that we can all choose differently. But America is unique, almost, in having a f fundamental point of commonality that is itself liberty. So it is possible in America to be an authoritarian and the identity that you're seeking to protect being one founded on liberty in the Constitution, etc., etc., right? So, libertarians talking to authoritarians, that's what we need to speak to. The commonality, the shared heritage, the what we already are, the who we already are. That is the authoritarian argument for liberty and libertarianism. That is kind of collapsing the dichotomy, maybe a divine paradox. Extremely powerful. In my in my lectures, I talk a lot about how to sell liberty to conservatives versus liberals. There's a whole other dimension here. How do you sell it to authoritarians, i.e. to anti-libertarians? And after reading Stenner's book, I now know more about that than I did before, and I am very grateful to her for that. Um, I am sure I will be talking more about this, maybe writing more about this going forward. I'm going into the break. <laughs> Well, I hope I have stimulated some of your thinking about authoritarianism and uh, where we are in the United States. I hope I've given you a kind of a useful lens um, through which to look at uh, where we are in the US and perhaps um, as libertarians or classical liberals to look at people and the motivations of people who most disagree with us, which is, of course is always useful, right? Um, what John Stuart Mill in On Liberty said, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. If you're a libertarian and you want to sell liberty to those who are most scared of it, you have to know why they're scared. What is it that's being threatened? And now you know the oneness of their country, of their society, and the sameness they feel with those, with others in that society, in that country. Okay. Uh, check out robinkerner.com if you want to see what I am doing. I have... Uh, a couple of things coming up. I'll be traveling down to Georgia within the month um, for some of my consulting work. As you know, I'm consulting for Tax Revolution Institute, so I'll be going down there to uh, have an organizational meeting. But most exciting 
In February is International Students for Liberty Conference in Washington, D.C. I will be there um, wearing a couple of hats. I will be wearing the Tax Revolution Institute hat, but I will also be wearing the Robin Kerner hat. Um, and uh, it's always good. It's always an amazing event. You know, maybe you'll find me there. I'm sure a load of my listeners will be there. So find me there. Um, I'll probably have a table on Media Row. Shouldn't be too hard to find. If you haven't purchased my book, and you're kind of interested in the kind of things that we talk about on this show, the psychology of politics, um, the idea of the ideas of love in politics and the relationship between love and liberty, um, then check out my book. It's If You Can Keep It, and you can buy a copy at ifyoucankeepit.us. And I always send folks there because if you order there, I will personally sign your book and personally mail it to you. Um, so as I say, we have a very <laughs> exciting uh a very exciting few weeks ahead, right, with the inauguration, which will be just got two weeks after this show comes out. Um, I wonder what we have in store, America. <laughs> Whatever we think about Donald Trump, we've got to say at least, I think this year is going to be more exciting than it would have been if we had got the alternative, right? Catch you all next week. Revolutionary talk for revolutionary times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm.